Hey folks, how you doing? Hopefully you're all having a great day today. This is a follow-up video for the elevator, the DIY elevator that I put in my shop to access the loft above. In that video, I said if you have any questions or comments, then leave them for me and I'll be sure to make a follow-up video because I knew that there's going to be tons of questions and comments on safety and safety and safety and safety and some other stuff too. Uh, so that's exactly what I... That's exactly what I did. I... I I printed off a bunch of the comments to make this particular video. Uh, most of them are safety related. Some of them, uh, and one of the benefits of doing this type of stuff is uh, I don't claim to know everything. I, I made some mistakes while making this and some of the comments pointed those mistakes out that just make total sense. Absolutely, I made those mistakes and actually having a discussion, discussion about it uh, makes a better situation for all of us to learn from. So. Anyway, I'm going to jump into the comments really quick and we'll probably move the camera around to show you some changes that I made. So first off, you can get 20 foot sections of the super strut from electrical supply stores. I did not know that. I got 10 foot sections at my local Lowe's because that's the first place that I found that sold them and I needed them, went and got them. Uh, 20 foot sections. So in this particular application, there's some pros and cons to, to getting 20 foot versus 10 foot sections. Number one, a pro is that you'll have a continuous run top to bottom without a break in the middle. So both the mine, both of the vertical, both of the vertical sections of super strut, there's a break somewhere right about there where the, there's a 10 foot section above and a shorter section below. And I lined these up really good. I clamped a straight edge next to them or something that, you know, made these align in, in line with one another and screwed them to the wall. And I'm not having any issues with them being misaligned. Uh, the other benefit of having a single piece would be, I guess, more strength, continuous strength top to bottom. I don't think that's a, an issue at all in this setup. Um, so yeah, you can get 20 foot sections, but I still would have had to cut them down in order for them to fit vertically because I don't have 20 feet of vertical headroom above it. So I would still have to cut it down and then the, the biggest con would be transporting a 20 foot section of this stuff. The 10 foot sections are, are, aren't light by any means, not super, super heavy, but they're not light by any means. And to transport the 20 foot sections, I have a 16 foot trailer. It would hang out four feet of it. And anyway, it, it's just much easier in my opinion to get the 10 foot sections, but I did not know they come in 20 foot sections and now I do, so thank you. I would replace the flexing super strut with an aluminum extrusion and similar profile to the one you have on your CNC table that should eliminate any flex. Well, the pieces of aluminum extrusion I have on my CNC machine are much larger in size to the pieces of super strut that I used. So if we're talking about just increasing the size, why not apply that same concept to the super strut and increase the size of the super strut to eliminate or drastically reduce the amount of flex. And if, if at that point, the, the criteria is just thicker mass, thicker size, well, it's much easier to source locally super strut than it is to source aluminum extrusion, extrusion which would be something that I'd have to order online and if I happen to order the wrong size, then you you know it's it's a little bit more inconvenient. So I think the, the key thing there is getting the correct size, maybe a thicker piece of alum of super strut and just going from there. Aluminum extrusion isn't really readily accessible where I live. Uh, not at all. So I still think that this is the route to go as far as material goes. If you have a rural king, they are even cheaper than tractor supply and have a bigger selection on hardware. Well, I mentioned tractor sp supply specifically because for me, uh, I used to shop at Lowe's basically for my hardware for many years uh, until we got a tractor supply store in, in the next town over. So the tractor supply actually is much, much cheaper than Lowe's and Home Depot where I used to shop. I didn't even know there was a place called tractor, or place called Rural King, but now I do. I don't have one in my area. So if any of you out there, uh, buy hardware at Lowe's or Home Depot, consider choosing tractor supply for, uh, for a cost savings if you have one locally. And apparently an even better cost savings is a Rural King if you have one of those locally. What you refer to as super strut, we call uni strut. And there's seven eighths of an inch, one and five eighths of an inch, three and a quarter inch, and six and a half inch thicknesses. I did not know about the thicknesses at all. This is the only size Unistrut I've ever seen being, being used. And honestly, this is the first time I've ever used it. This is the first application I've ever had to use 
uni strut. So learning experience for me. And what you call uni strut, or what I call super strut, they call uni strut. Well, locally here, it's it's sold as super strut. So I don't know if that's a brand specific kind of a thing. Uh, so if you're in your area looking for super strut and can't find it, I guess try and search for uni strut. There was a lot of comments as to the fall arrester, the attachment point for the fall arrester, and I should not have attached it to not only the super strut above, but I should also not have attached it to the uh, to the strap down below simply for redundancy and attachment points. Attach it to something completely different for redundancy in the event that, say, the strap down below fails. Well, if the strap down below fails, then both the fall arrester as well as the, the cable from the hoist, they don't even matter anymore. That one attachment point negates both of those. If the super strut above fails, then both the fall arrester as well as the hoist, they fail as well. So. Uh, attaching it to something completely different increases redundancy in the event of a failure. Makes absolute total sense, right? And I, I just simply spaced on that. I attached it to the Unistrut above simply because attaching it to something solid up there and attached it down below because my, my thinking there was that I was just basically trying to uh, eliminate the disaster of the cable itself snapping or the cable failing, right? So then you have the fall arrester to stop you. <laughs> Just a complete, um, you know, lapse of judgment on the other failure points. So that was very good. Let me let me actually bring this down and I'll show you the change that I made uh, to increase redund redundancy there. I moved the fall arrester from this strap to a bolt, right? So I have a piece of threaded rod. This is, I believe this is 5 8 of an inch threaded rod. Uh, just something that I had on hand. It's got a big wide washer, a lock washer, and a nut on this side. It goes through this solid piece of wood, through this plywood side, through this solid piece of wood, and a washer, a lock washer, and another nut over here to firmly secure this in place. So I think that this is a, well, I know this is a little bit more redundancy and a better attachment point than using uh, that strap attachment point. And I think that that size threaded rod, 5 eighths of an inch, going through these three materials to, I think that's a solid connection to the lift itself. I'm just guessing here, I'm not a structural engineer, but I think that uh, that's not a failure point, that 5 eighths of an inch thick threaded rod. Correct me if I'm wrong, and we'll do something else. <laughs> Uh, but this goes up, and you're probably not going to be able to see it from here, so I may switch over to a cell phone image. But the uh, fall arrester is attached to a doubled up chain, and each, each link of that chain is rated at 880 pounds. So there's two sections of chain, uh, two independent sections of chain, two independent loops that the fall arrester is attached to on top, which is also attached to that... Uh, two by ten support uh, that goes horizontally and right behind or right next to the the chain is where the vertical uh, stud goes down below to the uh, top plate on the wall so there is a uh, direct support against gravity very close to where the fall arrestor attachment point is several people suggested flipping the horizontal super strut up top where the where the, uh, the hoist is mounted. And what that does is it makes the flat piece of the super strut go from a state of tension, which is how I initially had it, to compression, which is how I have it now. I did flip that uh, based upon suggestions because it makes total sense. As force is being applied to the middle, uh, pulling down, if it was the way that I initially had it, then it basically wants to pull apart that horizontal piece of the super strut that is tension. If we flip it upside down so that the flat piece is on top, it wants to compress the top of the super strut, that flat piece, and that is compression, uh, much stronger than having a tension, a piece, a tension force applied to that particular piece. So yeah, I flipped it upside down. Thanks for the suggestion there, it makes total sense. A few people mentioned having some type of gate in the front or a swing out gate, some type of barrier in the front for added safety front of the lift as you ride up and down. And I think that is completely a personal choice. Number one, this is 
this is not a public lift. This is this. I, I have access to this lift, and nobody else, uh, nobody else does. Nobody else is allowed to ride the lift. There's absolutely no reason for anybody else to ride it. This is a a storage space above. It's not a play fort by any means. My shop is not a play fort for children. Um, and there, I think there's other safety precautions taken to prevent unwanted access to it. And at that point, it's just me using the lift. And I don't think a front gate would be necessary. Think about this. How many times have you climbed a ladder in your life without a fall arrestor? How many times have you climbed a ladder without some type of attachment to that particular ladder. I'm, I'm willing to guess that every single one of you out there, 99.9999% of everybody out there has never taken any other safety precautions climbing a ladder other than try not to fall. So it, it's very similar to that uh, in my opinion. So I'm not going to add a, a gate by a gate to the front of it. I just don't see a point in that. Just personal preference. I control who rides the lift. It's not a public area. A few people mentioned a GFCI circuit breaker would also take care of the water concern. If you don't know what a GFCI circuit breaker is, it's one of those circuit breakers in the United States. You'll typically see in your bathroom, in your kitchen, that has a little test button where you can trip the... It's a little breaker for a receptacle where you can trip it. Uh, GFCI stands for Ground Fault Circuit Interrupter. So any anytime you have a ground fault, something grounding out, it immediately disrupts power or stops power to that receptacle. You will see them in any place where moisture or water is, is, uh, is in the area. So typically in your bathrooms, kitchens, around your kitchen sink, um, front porch, back porch, around the perimeter of your house, outside. Uh, inside of a garage, any place where there's a potential for electricity interacting with water and moisture, which is <laughs> never a good thing. So yes, a GFCI outlet up there would completely solve the problem if water was to trickle down into the, um, into the engine hoist, electric hoist. But like I said, I don't see that happening because I think I've taken very good precautionary measures to keep the inside of the mini split clean with all those extra filters. As long as it stays clean, you should never have a overflowing water situation. Number two, if it does overflow, I'll be able to see it clear as day down here. It's going to drip and I'm going to notice it no matter what. Um, and also with the breaker at the, at the main breaker panel completely turned off, that also solves the issue of, of water being up there or electricity being up there if the, in the event of water uh, being in the circuit. So it's just, it's just a common sense on how you interact with it at that point, just flip the breaker. Also another mention of maybe a switched outlet to save wear and tear on the breaker. I don't think that's ever gonna be an issue. Breakers, uh, if, if that one breaks, it's not that expensive. If the breaker fails, it's not that expensive to replace and i don't think it i don't think it will i before i met my wife i was extreme cheapskate living on next to nothing uh and i would turn off the breaker to my uh to my water heater when i wasn't using it which was most of the time i would only turn it on about a half hour before taking a shower um so i would flip the breaker twice every single day and i did that for five, six years, something like that. And that breaker still works to this day. Uh, so I don't think that it's gonna be a failure point with the actual breaker wearing out. And if it does, it's very inexpensive to, to um, replace. Hello, sir. I need your videos making wood planer small. Please give me the video. My WhatsApp number is, I like turtles. You could add a lift scale or a load cell to make sure you stay under the load rating. So uh, I misspoke in the video that I said that the, the hoist was rated at 500 pounds. It's actually 550 pounds. And then since also um, making the video, I used the pulley down below snatch block to double it up so that I can get 1,100 pounds of lifting capacity. Now, I didn't do that specifically for the 1,100 pounds of lifting capacity. I did that to slow it down. When I was riding it on a single line, it just felt... It, uh, it, it felt a little too fast, so I, I doubled up the line. It gives me more strength as far as the lifting capacity. Um, but also, when I doubled up the line and attached the, the uh, hook on the end of the cable back up to the hoist itself, the, the, the 
what am I looking for? The force being applied was only on one side as the cable went up and down, and that was what was causing the twist of the unistrut, or the superstrut. And that twist is what I was noticing, not necessarily a flex in the uh, superstrut above. So when I attached the cable to the other side, it eliminated that, that twist completely. And now there's a very minimal bounce, I guess, very minimal uh, compared to what it was. So um, where was I going with that? What was the question? Oh, lift scale. So now the capacity of the lift itself is 1,100 pounds. Uh, I don't, I'm still shooting to not go over 500 pounds and really I don't ever see a situation where I would put that much weight on this due to the way that I'm using the loft above. So for, for lighter stuff, I have no problems, no concerns personally riding it up and down with lighter stuff. There are two 48 inch wide cabinets, which by the way, that was one of the reasons why I sized this the way I did is because I have 48 inch wide cabinets above and eventually they may have to come down. They may live the rest of their lives up there. I don't know, but if they want to come down, if I want them to come down, I wanted a lift wide enough that those could, those could fit on it. But in, in talking with other people and designing this, uh, I, I've always thought that if, if, if there's something crazy heavy that needs to go up or down, I'm not riding it up there. What I'll do is, is, let's just say those cabinets need to come down. I'll go up there, I'll ride it up there empty, put the cabinets on the lift, put them down, and have somebody else who's assisting me down here remove them from the lift, and ride it up there, or bring it up there empty, and then I'll ride it back down. I'm not gonna ride it if there's something crazy heavy. So, how much can this lift actually handle? Number one, I don't know, so I have to do some kind of educated guessing here. And number two, I'm not gonna test it to failure because I don't wanna rebuild it. <laughs> so here's my thinking behind this. I used four sheets of half inch pine CDX pine plywood uh, for uh, making this. So my search online it gives an average of like 40 pounds per half inch piece of plywood. So four times 40 pounds is 160 pounds. Now I did not use exactly 100% of those four sheets, probably about two thirds of those sheets were waste because uh, of the shapes of the cutouts. And also I did not use the full size, the full sheet on sheet number four. It was only like a quarter of it, if I'm not mistaken. So it's much less, the actual lift weighs much less than four sheets of plywood in my opinion. So let's, let's just, let's cons be, let's have a conservative estimate of exactly four sheets of plywood and that'll kind of give me a little bit of leeway by adding the weight of the bolts and the small pieces of pine that I added to either side. So let's just say 160 pounds for the lift. I weigh 165 pounds, add that together, that's what, 325 uh, for an easy number. Yeah, 325, that means 175 pounds of cargo, including, or on top of me, to safely be under 500 pounds. And I think that's, if I'm not mistaken, that's where the, the rating of the um, fall arrestor was at. So it's difficult for me to pick up 175 pounds. Of course, I can do that, but I don't see anything. I can't picture taking anything up there that's 175 pounds. And like I said, if it's super heavy, I'm not riding it up there. I'm going to go up there by myself, have somebody else put it on the platform, take it up there, I'll offload, and then I'll ride down by myself. So I don't... I don't think I'm going to exceed the, the weight limit and I'm not gonna test to failure to determine what the weight limit actually is. This platform may not be a good idea. If your daughter sees you using it, she'll want to ride on it with you. And to that I say, just because she wants something doesn't necessarily mean she's going to get it. To expand upon that also, I'm not gonna be using this in front of her. I'm not gonna advertise this. This is something that uh, is used very infrequently for a very specific purpose. And if she happens to be in the shop when I need to go up there, I don't see any reason why there's an immediate urgency for me to do that right then and there. I can wait until she's not in there and so she doesn't ever see it. Eventually, yes, she will grow up and understand what this is, uh, but that's there's other safeguards in place to not allow access to that. Um, and there's also many deterrents to, to prevent or detour someone from using it. Number one, nobody has access to my shop without me. Number two, if somebody 
has full understanding of how this works. There's a bunch of crap in the way. I store some tools in front of it. There is a fail safe switch on the remote. So a safety switch on the remote where you pre depress the switch and you have to twist to unlock it before it is even accessible to be used. So you can cut power at the switch without little kids knowing or understanding how that works. You can cut power to the, uh, circuit, the main circuit breaker upstairs and there's stuff in the way and there's locks on the door, all that good stuff. So um, like I said, just because she sees me doing something doesn't necessarily mean she gets what she wants. And that's, that's a basic, basic family housekeeping type of a thing. If you are one to pose this question, if you are one to keep uh, alcohol in your house, do you keep it under lock and key 24 seven? Or do you have a simple understanding that, hey, this is an adult beverage. This is not for children. Do you keep it in areas where it's not readily accessible? Yes, a kid can stack some stuff up, climb up on the counter, get in the cabinet above the refrigerator, that type of thing. So there's always that what if, but there's just like with alcohol in the house, uh, there's, there's a lot of safeguards in place. So just because she sees it doesn't mean she's going to get it. There's a few comments about uh, this resembling some other lifts that, that are online. And absolutely, yes, I, I think I mentioned this earlier. Uh, this is this design that I did is based upon inspiration from other YouTube videos. If you search on YouTube uh, DIY elevator, you'll find metal versions, steel, aluminum. You'll find um, many different plywood versions like this. You'll find solid wood versions. You'll find uh, people using repurposed, um, what was it, uh, forklift, an actual hydraulic forklift that you drive around where well, you can put the hydraulics, mount them securely to the wall and figure out the hydraulic system to have a dedicated hydraulic lift. So no, this is not my original idea. If there's many, many, many other versions out there that are very similar to this, uh, I kind of pulled inspiration from a bunch of different things. And, um, uh, you know, Steve Ramsey talks about woodworking in the woodworking world. Everything's a box, right? There's there's so much redundancy and very little 100% super uh, original type of stuff. What happens if you are up on the loft and you lose power? Uh, nothing really because the loft, I'm sorry, the hoist itself is not uh, dependent upon power to maintain its position. So as of right now, I, I hit I, a few minutes ago, I hit the reset button or the power safety button on the remote so i guess technically there's no power up there and even so when it is in its up position i flip the breaker so there's no power to the circuit and it still maintains its position so uh, power is not necessary to maintain its elevation you have to be very careful every time you are moving downstairs that the space underneath the elevator is clear and nobody stands or walks towards it i know it's obvious but you should not risk it. A lot of questions and or a lot of comments saying about taping off the floor and all that stuff. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an obvious situation. Don't stand underneath it. I don't, like I said, this is not a high traffic environment. Uh, I don't think that's necessary. Uh, and also make sure no one's underneath it. Of course, obviously. There's a lot of redundant um, safety questions about or comments about like adding even more safety precautions. And in, in this example, a second cable, inertia brakes, maybe some springs beneath, uh, all kinds of added super duper additional safety. And in my opinion, you can take safety as far as you want to. If you want to drive a vehicle with a seatbelt on and a fireproof flame retardant suit and a helmet and racing gloves and a roll cage to go check your mail, then by all means do so. Um, I think a lot of the stuff regarding this might have been a little bit blown out, blown out of proportion. And there's a reply that I think kind of sums it up a little bit. I think he took very sufficient safety precautions. It's not that high. It's not a kid's toy. And I'm sure most of us have been higher up on ladders with late, less safety measures. The fall arrestor is a good idea. Why not consider putting a little bit of lead roof flashing over the motor? So if the air conditioner ever leaks, it will just drip down. The more I think about that, the more I think it's actually not even necessary because the hoist itself is almost fully enclosed in a metal box, metal container. So if water touches the top of the, the, the housing for the hoist, it's going to go to either side and drip down the sides and then just drip from there. I, I don't think there's any path for water to very easily access the electrical components, which are also inside another sealed container. All the electrical stuff is inside. Uh, a few layers of plastic. I remember having to take, yeah, I had to take two layers of plastic off 
to, to access all the electrical stuff to extend the, the cord for the remote. So I actually don't think it's even necessary, to be honest with you, the more I think about it. There are four holes on the top, but that's for the brackets to mount to where, uh, where they are attached, where the, the hoist is attached to the super strut. And those are cranked down really, really tight with a big washer. And I just, I just really don't see water actually getting into the lift the more I even think about it. A lot of comments about keeping a ladder in the attic in case of, say, the winch overload or if I'm up there and power failure and I have no way to get down. Well, I do have a way to get down and I know for sure because I've already gotten up there and down by myself without a ladder. I was on top of the miter saw station a while ago and I was trying to plug something in the back side of the miter saw station. There's a receptacle back there and I needed an extension. I noticed that I had one upstairs. I just saw one up there. And rather than climbing down to the miter saw station, going to my ladder and getting back up, I simply climbed up from the top of the miter saw station into the loft above, got what I needed and got right back down on top of the miter saw station. So I know for sure I can get down on top of the miter saw station because I've already done that. So no ladder needed upstairs. That's it for all the questions and comments. It was a lot of redundancy. Hopefully this information helps. Uh, again, there's, there's two main takeaways here. Number one, it is a DIY solution. Do it yourself. And as I stated in the first video, when you do it yourself, you yourself are taking on those risks. So me, I'm taking on all these risks by riding it myself. And me, I'm taking on the responsibility of limiting access to it or controlling who actually uses it. My doors st stay locked, the, the power is off at the breaker, the power is off at the remote by the extra safety switch. There's crap in the way, there's tools in the way uh, to prevent it from actually being lowered to be, to, for it to be used. It's not readily used uh, in any other time in front of other people. I think I'm taking all of the, I think I'm taking appropriate safety precautions for this situation. Um, so yeah, if you feel inspired to make something like this, then uh, a lot of things to consider. Hopefully you guys found this information useful. You guys take care, have a great day, and I'll talk to you in the next video.